seated. So glad to be here in Chicago again to this great uh, fellowship with the Full Gospel Christian Businessman and the fellowship of the people, and to have with me as the, helping me and uh, one of my great associates and brother Tommy uh, Hicks. And we're under the great expectations this week for the Lord to do great things for us. And I hear that they've been meeting preceding this meeting, and it looks like that there's been some great things accomplished, and we are expecting a greater uh, as we go on towards the end time. And now we're to be here through next Sunday afternoon. I believe that is right. When Brother Carlson just made the statement that uh, these ministries, what they have to go through to make them ministries, how true. And Brother Joseph, standing by me, he said, um, well, he said, if you're not a soldier, you're not shot at. So, <laughs> although that was pretty well placed, that, that is right. And as uh, battles rage, why, you become a real target. <laughs> so uh, there's only one thing to do, put on the whole armor of faith, stand true to God, and march forward, that's all. God's army does not retreat, it goes on. Many of them drop off to the side and start this, that, or the other, but the army of God marches forward. We are going right on and on. Now, this week, I sent Billy over about uh, 3 o'clock or 2.30, and he said he stayed around till 3, and he found two people wanting to prayer cards, so and that was all. So we we'll give out, we'd be praying for the sick. Now, if uh, perhaps Brother Hick has got a great ministry of praying for the sick, he's probably already did that. And if you're along through the week now, I'll have Billy over here around about 6 o'clock every afternoon or something like that to give out the prayer cards. If anybody, when we get some people that wants to be prayed for, Brother Hicks and I and the other brethren will be here to pray for the sick all through the week. And we're expecting God to answer our prayer. And all these years... Now, about 15 years on the field around the world, I have never healed anybody in all my life, but I've sure had some marvelous answers to prayer, that God has healed the sick, lame, blind, and afflicted, till it's really been, to me, one of the, a thrilling, full-packed life to me. If I should be called this afternoon, I'd be thankful to God. For letting me know one thing, Jesus Christ is my Savior, to know that he lives now. And he is not dead, but is risen and alive forevermore. And now, this afternoon, before we approach the Word, and that I want to make this statement, if you excuse me just a moment for stopping, I want to try to make my messages this week uh, a little shorter than usual. I've got a name of preaching anywhere from one to ten hours or something like that, but I'll try to make it about 35, 40 minutes this week, the Lord willing, so people, most of the people I know, I think, are all the way from the south side. I think that's right down that way, south side, <clears throat> and uh, so, so you can get back in time, be back for the following service. Now, before we approach the Word, let us approach the author by prayer while we bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful to Thee for the privilege of assembling together on this rainy afternoon in the name of the Lord Jesus once more this side of His coming, believing that someday we'll assemble our last time until that great general assembly will be called in heaven. May our names be written plain and clear, washed in the blood of the Lamb, and we can answer at the roll call at the wedding supper. That's why we're here today, Father, is to prepare our hearts for that great event. We pray that you forgive us of our shortcomings, our mistakes, the things that we have did and said that was not right. Just remember us, Father, that we are human and subject to all kinds of mistakes. And if we didn't have thy promise of thy grace we would all be lost. But it's through thy grace that we stand today as soldiers believing by faith that God has saved us from a life of 
sin and from an eternal punishment in the world hereafter. We ask now that you will remember all of our efforts. You know why they're put forth. You know why we're here. You know why I answered Brother Carlson that night on the phone. Yes, I feel led. Now, Father, the rest is in your hands. Do with us as you see fit, for we present ourselves to thee with thy word in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Over in the book of Galatians, rather, for our text this afternoon, I want to take the subject from the third chapter of Galatians and the 29th verse. For if ye be in Christ, then... Are ye Abraham's seed and are heirs according to the promise? And now I'm approaching this subject this afternoon, the third time that I have, in the last two months, that I have preached on this subject. Because I did this is because thinking that that if we did not have a healing service, I could dedicate a little more time to this because, to my opinion, it's one of the great outstanding uh, messages for this hour that we're living in. First, I would just like to ask this question, how many are here that are Christians, born-again Christians? Raise your hand. All over the building, everywhere. I believe it's 100% everywhere, born-again Christians. The... Um, the custodian would, you know, I'm not one of these spotlight preachers, and, and I, I would if you turn those big lights out, if, it, if we can do it, I'll appreciate it very much. Um, I don't like these, what they call line lights and <laughs> different kind of lights. I like the Holy Spirit light. That's the only one I can think of, and these others kind of upset me a little. And... Um, so now, this afternoon, I, you have your Bibles and maybe a pencil and paper. I would like for you to write these down and study them uh, after the services is over and in the coming week. Now, I believe we're allotted here to about what time? Till 6 o'clock. That'll let me get one-third of it finished. And so then um, a little later, maybe we can go into it a little better. Now, thank you, sir. That's very, very fine. Now you look better. I, um, I want to take this subject or the, draw from this subject the context I hope to be this, Abraham and his seed after him. Now, I would like to make I believe these are speakers on each side here, and I want you to be sure to keep these in mind. And I've got two pages of scriptures written out here that I would like to refer to these scriptures to you, because that I truly believe with all my heart that we're living just in the afternoon of time of uh, the evening lights going out and uh, the coming of Christ is at hand. And I believe substantially and biblically I can prove that by the scriptures beyond any shadow of doubt that we're at the end time. Now whether I can satisfy you with it or not, I do not know. But to me, it certainly satisfies me, and being not efficient in education, therefore I approach the Scriptures from the standpoint of a type, and more like a typologist to type what has been, what will be, because we know that the Scriptures each have a compound uh, uh, meaning. That, uh, like in Matthew 3, it said, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Now, if you run that reference back, you'll find out that it meant Jacob his son and also Jesus his son. So, in typing, we see where the Old Testament types the new. 
and all these different shadows and types, like the, the moon and the sun, is a type of Christ and the church. And as the sun goes down, the moon gives light in the absence of the sun, just like as the sun left the earth to go into glory to the Father, then the moon, the church, gives the light. And how the moon gets its light is reflecting the sunlight to the earth, or a lesser light. And all these things, it may seem more like a baby farm for great theologians, but I don't believe I'm talking to too many of those. And if, if I am, then uh, you uh, excuse my illiterate uh, way of trying to present it, but I would ask that you would search it thoroughly before you rudely disagree. It. Now, to Abraham and his seed. I'm going to take on this side over here to be Abraham. Take on this side like this speaker, his seed after him. Now, this speaker here represents Abraham, and this speaker represents his seed after him. Now, the Bible said over here in, in Galatians 3.29, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and, and heirs according to the promise. Now, we all will agree that the promise was given to Abraham. And we've often wondered, and I have approached this text uh, in another angle than what I'm tending to this afternoon. I've approached it in the way of faith for the church, the believers, and so forth to build faith on healing. But being this afternoon, they didn't know one for the cards, and I thought it'd give me time to explain this while we had a chance. Now, Abraham, I want the congregation to say it with me, all the, the class, that I'll call you, to say it with me. On this side is Abraham, Abraham, and his seed after him. Now, the promise was made to Abraham and, conjunction, it ties the sentence, Abraham and his seed seed after him. Then the scripture said, if ye be in Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed. Is that right? Now, how do we get in Christ? The subject starts on this. How do we come Christ? It's when we are become Christians. How do we become Christians? When we are filled with the Spirit of Christ then our life is governed by the life of Christ which is in us. Now, like if a vine brought forth a, a, a grapevine, it, it brings forth grapes. And a watermelon vine brings forth a watermelon. Then if Christ be in you, then the life that Christ lived and the works that Christ did You'll do also. He said so in St. John 14, uh, 7 or 8, I believe it is. It said, uh, the works that I do shall you do also. He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he also, and more than this shall he do, for I go to the Father. Now, promise made to Christ or to Abraham and his seed, and we being in Christ are Abraham's seed. Now, how do we get into Christ? Do we get into Christ by uh, profession? No. Do we get into Christ by joining church? No. Do we get into Christ by water baptism? No. How do we get into Christ? 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, said that by one Spirit, we are all baptized into one body, which is the body of Christ. By one Spirit, we're all baptized into one body and become members of this body. Now, we remember that by this Holy Spirit, we are brought into the body of Christ and free from the judgments of God. 
We cannot come into judgment after you are in Christ because Christ took the judgment for you. He stood in the place, just like Adam. In the beginning, Adam was not deceived. And Second Timothy tells us so. That Adam was not deceived, but Eve being deceived was in the transgression. Now, Adam was not deceived. He knew exactly what he was doing, but Eve was deceived. She thought she was doing what was right. Satan gave her about 95% pure gospel. And the other 5% was enough to throw that off. So we've got to be not just part gospel. We've got to be full gospel. We've got to have the entire word. For the Antichrist is a part gospel preacher. We know that. And his works are part gospel. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 35, that the Antichrist in the last days would be so close like the real Christ to it would deceive the very elected if it was possible. I heard our brother Billy Graham say a few days ago in a message that the Antichrist had already deceived the elected. But that isn't so, Brother Billy. I'm not disagreeing with a great evangelist like that. But they cannot, if it was possible, but it's not possible because the church was elected to eternal salvation. And it, there's nothing can separate them. They are Christ. And that, that's it. They're in the body of Christ and nothing can separate them. And that's part of the subject this afternoon. Now we're going to approach and find out what Abraham was. And then what his seed would be after him. Now, I'd like to say this now in regard the first church, that Christian church that was established, was established in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Every theologian will have to agree with that. Every theologian takes their church back to that time, the Catholic church. And it's true, the Catholic Church began on the day of Pentecost. Exactly right. But on down in a, about 200 years after, 300 years later, they got away from that and become into an organization. And then they organized the great universal church, which Catholic means universal. And from that they began to have an apostolic succession and uh, bring up another man to take Peter's place and popes to begin to call them after bishops and on and on. And they actually begin at Pentecost. That's right, because all Christendom begin at Pentecost. Now, the thing that I wonder, if we all believe that we begin back there, then why are not we doing as they did back there? Why haven't we got the blessings of God upon the church as they had then? Let us be Catholic or whatever we are. So why haven't we got the same spirit moving and doing the same works that they did back there? It's because we get a little something or other and settle down on it and make a doctrine out of it and a period and organize it and let it go like that and then we say, here we are. God moves right off and leaves us. That's just what he did to Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, and Pentecostal and on and on. He's done the same thing. And he'll continue to do it when you draw a line and say that, well, we're going to group ourselves together and separate ourselves from the rest of them. The Bible said they'd do that in the last days, seemingly not having the faith. And that's right. We want the faith that was once. Now we begin there and know that that was the beginning of the church. And that mainly in the beginning was all Jews. After the Jewish people... Uh, evangelized, then it went into the Romans and to the Greeks and so forth and started. But the Reformation come and the, uh, back in the early 1500s and there began the Christian church begin to organize itself or get itself together and we're living in the last church age now, the Lady Ossian, according to Scripture. Now, that's uh, Abraham. This is his seed after him. Now turn, if you wish to, to Genesis 12, and we begin where God called Abraham. Now the first thing I want you to know that uh, when God in Genesis 12 called Abraham, it was by election. It wasn't because Abraham was good. 
It wasn't because Abraham deserved it. It was because that God chose Abraham. Not Abraham choosing God, it was God choosing Abraham. And that's the way he calls his seed too. Not what you want to be, not him that willeth or him that runneth, but God to show us mercy. Is that scripture? Certainly. It's not what you want to be, it's what God has chose you to be. Abraham and his seed after him. Not seeds now, seed after him. Now, the promised seed. Now we find out that when God called Abraham, it was by election. I've heard people many times say, I sought God, I sought God. No, I differ with you. You never did seek God. God sought you first. You never seek after God. It's God seeking after you. It's you that will not surrender to God. It's just like what if you could tell the hog and the hog pen that, that he shouldn't eat slop. If he could speak, he'd tell you, why well, you tend to your own business. See? Until his nature's changed, then he'll always remain a hog. You'll always remain what you, a sinner, because you're born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. And you're a sinner by birth. And look what Adam did. As soon as he become a sinner, he never tried to seek God. It was God seeking Adam. He really represented the human race right there. When he hid himself behind some fig leaves that he made himself like most people do today. I belong to the church and I've got my fig leaf apron on. But it was God seeking after the Adam and not Adam seeking after God. It should have been Adam screaming, Father, Father, where art thou? Instead it was God saying, Adam, Adam, where art thou? And that's the same thing today. So there's just not one bit of goodness about us that we could say we had anything to do with our salvation. It was God calling us by election. Now, I want you to keep in mind of three, all times these three classes of people on earth, they came from three races of people. They came from Ham, Sham, and Japheth. We know it's Peter on the day of Pentecost when Jesus had given him the keys, opened the gospel to the Jews, then to the Samaritans, and then to the Gentiles. That finished it. According to Scripture, all the races of the earth come from those three boys. And now there's three classes of people. There always is an ever congregation made up everywhere, wherever you find them. That's believers, make believers and unbelievers. You find those three classes of people in probably every church there is in the world. is make believers and unbelievers and believers. Now, Abraham called by grace. Now, God didn't say, and notice, God, when he called Abraham, he didn't say, Abraham, if you will do a certain thing, I will do a certain thing. He said, Abraham, I have already done it. Not what you did, what I did, what God did, he said. Now, when he made a covenant with Adam, if you will not touch that tree, you will live forever. Adam broke it. Moses, them, if you keep the commandments, I'll, uh, I'll do so and so. If you break the commandments, I'll do so and so. When God makes a covenant with man, man breaks his covenant with God. But so that the elected, the church, the elected people, the called out, separated group of people would be sure to be saved, God called them by his grace. Not that God would say, I choose you and condemn you. Never. But if he's infinite, how many believe he's infinite? Well, then he knowed, from the be he knowed from the beginning what the end would be. That's what the Scripture says. He's omnipresent, omnipotent, omnipotent, and infinite. Now, if he's infinite, by his foreknowledge, he knew who would come to him and who would not come to him. He knew who would be saved and who would not be saved. That would certainly clear up Romans 8 and 9 for you if there's any question about God, uh, whether he calls his uh, children by election or not. For there, Paul speaking, 
of Esau and Jacob before either child was born, not even knowing what was right or wrong, God said, I love Jacob and, and hate Esau before either child had a, 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 a way to even make a choice. But God knew from the beginning what Esau was. He knew what Jacob was. God knew in the beginning what you were and what you are not. So therefore, we cannot be nothing but what, if we cannot be like somebody else, let's just be what God made us. That's all we can do. Anything other than that, it'd be hypocrisy. We'd be a hypocrite. So we do not want to be that. It'd be better to be an infidel than to be a hypocrite. Let's be just what we are. And all these things have to, have to operate together to make the great wheels of God go on and not one thing is going wrong. I'll guarantee you that. Everything, you think the devil could ever conquer God? No, certainly not. He cannot. God, everything's making it work together for the good to them and love him. He's just making everything pull right in exactly right. The only thing he has trouble with is jerk us back in line where we ought to be. That's where God has his trouble. Now he called Jacob, not uh, called uh, Abraham, pardon me, by election and by grace and giving eternal life and told him he'd come to him in an old age. He didn't have to do one thing about it. Only thing, it was by grace. And that's exactly the way the church is called today. Is by grace are you saved through faith. And we know that's right. God calls the church by His grace. If it wasn't today for the grace of God, you'd be out here in the rain watching a ball game somewhere. You'd be out here on the highways running around. You'd be in a bar room somewhere. Be out with some man's wife or some woman's husband. You'd be a, out in the world. But it's by the calling and grace of God that He changed your minds and made you new creatures in Christ Jesus and our soul looks up to Him today with expectations of His coming. Therefore, over in Colossians, we find Colossians 3, it said, Don't lie to one another and all these things that you used to do. Lay them things aside. No malice, no strife, and everything. And love one another. For our life, we are dead. Our life is hid in God through Christ and sealed there by the Holy Ghost. And when Christ, which is our life, shall appear, we shall appear with Him. Oh, what a, a man, what it would do to a man or woman that has that hope living in them today to see that we're in the last days and know that our life, Christ, when He appears, will appear alive with Him. Amen. We have the earnest of it now by the Holy Spirit. God called Abraham, and notice when God called Abraham, He called him to separate himself from all the rest of the unbelief. No matter how religious they was, how pious they was, how nice they was, he called for a complete separation. And God, when he calls the man, he calls him to complete separation if he is the seed of Abraham. To separate yourself from the things of the world, from this modern life. All the ministers today are having such a time where they'll get their people out to prayer meeting on Wednesday night. They, they love television programs, and, uh, and they love uh, amusement. Sunday, they don't want to come to church on Sunday, many of them. They tell me, the ministers, that the church pews are empty, emptying out because that people are beginning to go. The world offers so much class and so much fancy and, and uh, pencil uh, upon the things of the world, and the people fall for that. Now, that shows that at the beginning they had nothing to start with. For if you love God, I, you, can't, you couldn't wire you away from church. They couldn't chain you away from it. They can't hide a believer from God. He, in his heart, oh, he might be all deceived. Now, there's many people that actually think that they're right. But if you just stop and watch your life, you'd see there, the Spirit of God isn't in there. If it doesn't cope with this Bible, then there's something wrong with the experience that you have. So you must come back and line up with the Word to see if the life of God is in you. If you love the world better than you love prayer meeting, if you'd rather watch a television program than to pray, there's something wrong with you. If you'd rather take a Sunday afternoon ride instead of going to church, there's something wrong with you somewhere. 
Because where your heart is there, your treasures are also, said the Lord Jesus. Your heart is built into it. You're a part of it. You become a part of Christ because you're built into the structure of Christ. Because you're the bride of Christ if you love him. Now, God called him by uh, election, giving the covenant in Genesis, the 12th chapter. Now, we want to remember that he called a total separation from all the things of the world. Now, Abraham did not obey God. Now, I'm going to call that... Now, if, there, if I speak one word here this afternoon that's against anybody's belief, well, now, you just don't get up and go out because that shows your race, you see. But just, uh, it, uh, let me say this. I believe if a man is a Catholic, and he's depending on the Catholic Church for salvation, he's lost. I believe if a man belongs to the Catholic Church and is depending on Jesus Christ for salvation, he's saved. If he's a Baptist or a Pentecostal and depending on the Church for salvation, he's lost. If he's depending on Jesus Christ, he's saved because by faith are you saved through grace. See, if you're... Your personal faith in Christ is what saves you, and no church can save you. No organization can save you. No group of people can save you. It's Christ and Him alone that you're saved. And so you must keep that in mind. So now, if I strike a denomination this afternoon or something that you belong to, please just set quite a little bit till I make this point for the people, if you will. Now, we find out that justification, God called Abraham by justification, and by grace he called him, by election he was elected, by grace he was called, and given the covenant with him, before Abraham had one word to say whether it was right or wrong, whether he would or would not, God called him. Is that right? Now, you read the first, the twelfth chapter of Genesis, the first, about the first 10 or 15 verses, and you'll catch it. All right. Now, and then we notice that in the 15th chapter of Genesis, now that's what God did something else to Abraham. Now, how did we call the, how did he call Abraham? By faith, called him by grace, saved him by grace, justified him by grace. Is that right? How did he call the church Abraham's seed? By faith, by grace, justification, by grace, by faith. Just as he did Abraham, so did he the seed of Abraham after him. All that believe that say amen. amen. Sure, our justification. Now what church would represent justification? In the first Reformation was Martin Luther, who came forth preaching justification by faith. All of us know that, that young German priest that threw the uh, communion on the altar and said that it was not the blood of Jesus Christ or the kosher bread, that he knew it was just uh, bread and, and wine. So he, he threw it on the altar and said it represented the body of Christ. And that's the difference that separates Catholic from Protestant. One said, Catholic says it is the body of Christ. And the other said it represents the body of Christ. Now, Luther said the just shall live by faith. And that's exactly the first calling of the seed of Abraham after the hundreds of years of dark ages to make up the church that will go in the rapture. Now, bear with it a minute. Now, how do you call Abraham? Genesis 12 now. By faith. Justification by faith. He called the seed of Abraham the next, which was by faith, by justification. Now, Abraham did not fully obey God. Until he fully obeyed God, God never did confirm the covenant to him. Now, in the 15th chapter, we find out that he confirmed the covenant to Abraham. How did he do it? Notice, he told Abraham in the 15th chapter, you'll notice this, that he told him to take a heifer of three years old, a goat, a sheep, three years old, and split them apart and uh, to offer them to him. And Abraham, taking these three animals of three years, 
As I told you, three separations, the three like the Trinity, and so forth, the three. Now, we see that he cut these open and separated them. And then he put two a uh, turtle dove and a young pigeon in there. He never divided them birds. Because from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the blood for the sacrifice was changed, but turtle dove and pigeon represented healing. For we know that was the cleansing of leprosy and so forth for healing. And healing has always been based upon your faith in God. Then if I say, you say healing wasn't included in the New Testament, in the New Atonement. Well, if the Old Atonement had healing in it, isn't this a better one? How could you say then it isn't? But it's all based the same. Like Brother Egri or some of these brethren not long ago, the Lutheran brothers, who told me they know the witch that healed the people. I said, no, you never. You never seen no witch heal a person. Yet I've been in Africa and seen them go before the witch doctor and get healed. In La Salle Rains, France, there's a place there down at, at uh, there by the, um, I think of the Seine River it is, where the Church of Notre Dame, there's a dead woman buried there, this great big place rub, where they go there and rub it to keep plagues off the city, this rock above this dead woman. Well, certainly, and things happen. Sure, it's the approach that people think they're approaching God to that idol. People think they're approaching God to the witch doctor. And many times people on the field today here in America, man, say, just come, oh, I, I got healing. That, that's wrong. The good, sound gospel teachers don't teach it like that. They teach it as an atonement. Christ heals you. And they're here just as man of God, as faith, to believe and pray for you. But when you hear somebody say, I can heal you, I got healing, I've done this, that is wrong. Now, Christ did that for you when he died at Calvary for you. That's the blessing that belongs to you. It's your... Uh, and these people are approaching these idols and images and witch doctors and fortune tellers and all those different things like that. They get healed because they believe that through there they're approaching God and divine healing is based upon, upon faith if you believe it. Now, that's the reason the turtle dove and pigeon wasn't separated. I told you someday I could get to that, and I thought having as much time as I have this afternoon, I would try to get to it for you. That's the reason it was not, uh, they wasn't separated. But the others was separated, cut in two. Now what was God doing to kill these animals? It's taking blood. In order for the sacrifice or the cleansing of sin, there has to be a blood offering. God based that in Genesis when man tried to build himself an organization or some kind of a fig leaf apron and get around it, God refused to look at him. And God, when God once makes a, a statement, when God once says anything, when God ever once called on the scene to make a decision, that decision he makes has to stand for eternity. Because his word is perfect. He cannot go back and say, I was mistaken yesterday, I know more about it today. How can he be infinite and, and make a, a statement and, and then have to go back on it. How that gives us confidence in the one that we're talking about, God. He cannot fail. If God has ever called to heal a sick man and he heal him on the basis of his faith, if another man comes on the same ground, he's got to meet that same condition or he did wrong when he healed the first man. Certainly, if he saved the man on the basis of faith, then how are we going to get in then upon church joining and sprinkling and baptisms and so forth? It's by faith, by grace, by the power of God. By something that you, something that you met God's requirement and He called you and changed your life before you even could do anything about it. For there's nothing in your center to begin with. And there's nothing there to change. So God, by His grace, foreknow you and calls you to His ministry and to His wedding supper. Because it's nothing you can do about it all. God's grace altogether. God did it by grace. He that heareth my words and believeth on Him that sent me, not make believeth, but believeth on Him that sent me, hath present His everlasting life and shall not come into the judgment, but pass from death unto life. Amen. How are we going to get around that? There's so much make-believe. 
going on sensations and different things like that, but within your heart you believe it. When something's happened to you, it's God did it. And God's the only one that can do it. So God, by grace and election, put that in your heart to believe it. It wasn't there to begin with, and you had no way of putting it there. God placed it there, and you answered the call. Now, notice, in Genesis, the 15th chapter, when he taught Abraham the separation, when Abraham was ready to separate himself by, from unbelief, believing Lot, the lukewarm church members, when Lot went out into Sodom and, and become the mayor of the city and built him a nice church down there or something, whatever he did, then God met Abraham and they offered a blood sacrifice for separation and confirmed the covenant to Abraham. Amen. For without the shedding of blood, there's no separation from sin. It's through the shed blood. Now, notice what he, what taking place. He took the animals and cut them apart. Abraham watched until the sun went down. And there was a, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham. And when he noticed the deep sleep come, that meant death. It's due to all of us. We're all coming there. So that great eternal sleep. Now, we noticed immediately after that, he looked before him in a great horror of blackness and a smoking furnace. What is it? Hell. Down through the uh, valley of the shadow of death. Every man goes into hell. That's where he belongs at. And then just beyond that, one a little white light that went in between each one of those cuts of flesh. Abraham having the covenant confirmed to him by the Lord God that how he was going to take Abraham and make him a father of nations, how he was going to save Abraham in his seat, he is making a confirmation of the covenant by the shed blood of the clean offered animals. Now, how do we make a covenant? Say, for instance, Brother Carlson, you stand up this minute, Brother Carlson. If I was going to say, Brother Carlson, say, Brother Bram, will uh, you come to Miami at the, at the meeting? I'd say, well, let's think it over, Brother Carlson. I'd say, well, I believe so. All right, I'll come, Brother Carlson. Shake. See, that's a covenant. We'll see that. That's right. That's got it. See, we'll make the covenant like that. That's the way we make a covenant. How do, you know in Japan how to make a covenant? They go out, we go out and eat usually. The Japanese get a little cruise of salt and throw a little salt on one another. That's how they make the covenant with each other. It's called salt and a contact. It's the Savior, you see. So they throw the salt on one another, making a covenant. But in the days of Abraham, you know how they made a covenant back in the eastern oriental countries then? They killed a beast. And they stood between these dead pieces of beast. They wrote on the parchment of the lamb skin, whatever it was, and made this Jewish writing, the covenant, whatever it was. And then they, over this dead beast's body, they took an oath that if they broke this covenant, let them be cut into pieces like this dead beast was. Then they took the skin and tore it apart, and one kept one piece, and one kept the other piece. And then when this covenant was brought back, or when the covenant was brought to its fullness, then these two pieces had to be dovetailed together and made that skin and them letters meet letter by letter. That's the way the covenant was confirmed to Abraham. That's, we were showing him there what he was going to do in the times to come through the royal seed that he had promised him, yet him without any children. He had promised him the son that he was going to have it. He was 75 years old and Sarah was 65. When the promises made, and it's 25 years later before the, the promises ever fulfilled, but God kept His promise with him because Abraham kept faith in God. Now, all along, instead of getting weaker, Abraham got stronger, the Bible says. He was stronger, giving praise to God. He knew it was going to happen. No matter how long it lingers, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Like people today. They say, oh, the Bible says this. They say, there's no difference from the time our fathers fell asleep. Oh, I've heard that coming of the Lord since I was a little kid. My mother said she heard her mother talk about it. There's no such a thing. 
You see, then they go out and eat, drink, and be merry. You see that? They go out and start off because why? There's never been any confirmation of it in their heart yet. But when God once confirms that in your heart, instead of, if you're a real true seed of Abraham, instead of getting weaker as you see the days go by, you get stronger. And all the time you say, well, if grandmother didn't see it and mother didn't see it, if I don't see it, I'll be looking for it. And if I don't, my children will see it. We are, I'm believing it. I fall asleep in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, or seventh watch. Either church age, the first church age, or to the last church age, those watches, which are watches. If I fall asleep in each one of them, no matter where it is, I'll awaken him that morning. So I'm going to be ready, believing it is coming to this age. Now, but when he gets slothful and say, well, uh, well, I've heard that stuff and go on. See, it's not Abraham's seed. Abraham's seed doesn't take back. They're not up and down and in and out and backslid one day and go to church the next day and they come back. They stay put. Whether they're in Christ in there, they stand, there's nothing and shake them. Why, Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church, the gates of hell can't prevail against it. God done made the covenant with Abraham and his seed after him, and that church will be there without spot or wrinkle. You can just depend on that. So you see, these, this piece of goods are... Or cloth that was in them days, not cloth but a skin, was tore apart, one man taking one piece, the other man taking the other piece. And then when this covenant was brought to its fullness, then they come back together, and there's no way to impersonate it, because these two pieces had to be just exactly the same in the skin, and also in the, the writing, they had to dovetail letter by letter. Now, that's exactly what God did by the royal seed of Abraham. Now, I know Isaac was the seed of Abraham potentially. It was the natural seed of Abraham, but not the real seed of Abraham. The real seed of Abraham was Christ, the royal seed. Isaac only was a substitutionary until Christ came, which was the seed of Abraham. Now, and then the real seed of Abraham believes the promise just like Abraham did because it's to Abraham and his seed after him. Now, watch what God did to the royal seed to make the covenant uh, confirmed. He took Christ, which was the seed of Abraham, on Calvary. He tore him apart. He took the spirit uh, off of him and put his body in the grave and his soul in hell and raised him up on the third day and raised up his body and brought it up into glory, and there sent the Spirit back down and kept the body on his right-hand side. Sent the Spirit back down to live in the church, to make a church just so much with the life of Christ that in the resurrection the two will come together, bride and bridegroom, the church, and Christ will be exactly alike with the same kind of ministry, same kind of power, same kind of spirit. He raised up the body of Jesus Christ and set it on his right side, his right hand, and poured down the Spirit upon the church on the day of Pentecost. That's how God proved his covenant with his church. And Jesus said, He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also. And we see that that's God's way he confirmed his covenant with his church. Amen. By blood offering. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now he sanctified that church and cleansed it, separated it. And when separation comes, means to be set aside. So actually the word sanctify is a Greek word compound, which means sanctify, cleanse, and set aside for service. Now the altar sanctified the vessel, and then they set it aside for service. So what, what, who was the next messenger on earth that preached justification? Luther to the seed. What was the next message? Wesley, Methodist, preached sanctification, second definite work of grace. We find all of us know that. We're aware of that. Now look, what he did to Abraham by justification, he did to his seed. What he did to Abraham through sanctification, separation when he did he did the same thing when the church separates itself from all the things of the world and God applies the blood to it. 
Now, then when he does that, then you don't want more smoking, drinking, no more of this running around, carrying on. You're separated people. That's right. God separates you as a peculiar people. A lot of make-believes go along in all these things. But yet the real true church, I'm talking about the, the real seed of Abraham, the one that really is the seed. Now, notice the next thing he did then. After doing that, we find out, now, did he call Abraham by grace? Amen. Did he call his church by grace? Amen. Did he sanctify Abraham? Uh, Work by, uh, by a blood offering? Amen. Did he do the same thing back here through Wesley? Amen. Now, now in the 17th chapter of Genesis, turn the first chapter, the first verse, God appears to Abraham in the name of, of Almighty God, which the Hebrew word means El Shaddai. El means breast and uh, El means strong one, and Shad means breast like a woman's breast, and Shaddai is breasted. Abraham, you're 99 years old. Think of that. And you have come to justification. You've come to sanctification. And now I'm appearing to you as a strong-breasted God. Amen. Now, in other words, Abraham, you, your, your life is dead. As far as that concerned, the life of your body is dead. The uh, deadness of Sarah's womb, it, it, it just wasn't, she was sterile to begin with. And now look how old she is now. She's, if he's 99, she's 89. And so now, look how old you are, look how old Sarah is. But I am the strong one who gives myself out to you. Lay upon my bosom and nurse yourself, my own life, into you. I, by taking my life into you, I'll give you strength for the coming son, for the coming one. That's the thing he done to the church after they come through justification, sanctification. When did he do to the church? All of those was orders that were done through faith and grace. But on the, on the Pentecostal move, God called his sanctified people to his breast to nurse from him the life that was in God in them. There is a baptism of the Holy Ghost for the church just like he did to Abraham. There's the elect Pentecostal group that they call fanatics today. I mean the elected group. There they are just as he called justification, sanctification, and filled Abraham with his own strength he called the church to justification, sanctification, and filled the church with his own strength, his spirit, into the church and give the church the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that was the great next great move that struck the earth. We know that. Martin Luther, John Wesley, and the Pentecostal move. That's been the move. Justification, sanctification. Baptism of the Holy Ghost, just the same as he did to Abraham, he did it to his seed after him. Do you get it now? Now, mark down the fourth and fifth verse in that same chapter there, in the 17th. Now, I want you to notice what God did here. He, God cannot de defile his own laws. He has to keep his own laws. So God cannot disobey his own laws. He cannot annul his own laws. And then in order to be God... Now, if we notice in the Old Testament, there was when a child was born in a family, that child was, uh, say, a boy. He was an heir, of course. But before that child was fully uh, an heir of all the things that his father had, before he came into power, he was first put under a tutor. And this tutor raised this son. Now, we all the clergy know that. That he was put under a tutor. And this tutor was a man that the father searched out to find the very best man he could find because that's his son. That's what's going to fall heir to him afterwards. So then he hunts a good tutor. Not a tutor that'll say, well, uh, uh, tell a lie and say, oh, your church is just doing fine. Your, your little son's just doing fine. When he is, and he's a little rascal. 
that that's too much of trouble there to many of our bishops and so forth and all of our man made tutors. Oh, your church is doing all right, but it's a lie. It's not. Having a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. Something wrong somewhere. So when the father got the very best tutor he could find, the best razors. Now how that tutor must have blushed when he walked up in front of the father and said, Oh, your son, how's he, how is my son doing? The father was busy and had a great kingdom and many, see, like, uh, many places and tenants and business to take care of. Now, how that tutor must have felt to walk up, no, he's hired by the father, to walk up and say, Oh, your son, mm. oh, he's horrible. I, I just can't make him listen to a thing. He's going to have his own hard-headed way. The most hard-headed kid i ever seen in my life. He just, he won't listen. I'll, I've got your book of laws here. I'll lay them right down to him. But he knows what he's going to do. The old man might have run it one way, but he's going to run it another way. How that tutor must have blushed when he had to come and tell the father that. How the father must have felt about it, too. And how the father must feel today. I hope this don't hurt. Just enough to make you get straightened out. For my hour is soon at hand. Notice. But this must be said. How that the Holy Spirit was made tutor over the house of God. Not some dominating bishop. Not some overpowering organization. Not some of these man-made theories. The child of God is to listen to the Holy Spirit, the writing of the Word. The real child of God, the real son of Abraham. Now here's where the separating time comes. Notice, oh, we say we're a Pentecostal. You settled it there, but you just got started then. See? Now, how he must have felt, how the Holy Spirit must feel today to go before God the Father. I want you to tell me, on the day of Pentecost, did God ordain a Roman priest to be father? No. Tutor? No. Did he ordain a Methodist bishop? No. Pentecostal presbyter? No. no, sir. He sent the Holy Ghost down to be the ruler of the church. Exactly right. What happened to it? Jesus catching John up and he said there he would not dying. Some of them said he said it, but he didn't do it. He said, what will happen to this man after resurrection? Of what business is yours that he stays till I come? But instead of doing that, be it they said it, he just raised him up and showed him on over till he did come at the end of the church age. So he brought up, remember, Jesus said in the second church age, the Smyrna, there was a a deeds of the Nicolaitans. And what was the deeds in the second church become a doctrine in the third church age. Now what? That word's not used nowhere else in the Bible. I looked it up to find out what it was. Nico means to conquer. Lethian means the laity. Conquer the laity. Make a holy man. Somebody that's holier than thou art. Just go up and get somebody and he'll be some half God or something like that to stand up and you do what you please and he'll forgive the sins and there you go. Conquer the lady. Lay it there. Take the Holy Spirit away from the church out there and put it all on the platform. That was not God. Wait a minute. No man on the platform's got a right to say he's the only one that's got the Holy Ghost and he's the only one that's got to say so in it. The Holy Spirit to the whole entire body of Christ. That's who that works. Tongues, interpretations, gifts, manifestations of the Holy Spirit. But we conquered it. Sure. The very thing that we come out of, Pentecost went right back into it again. Just as hard as they could go. The very thing that you used to call old formal Baptist and Methodist, it ain't formal Baptist, it's formal Pentecostals now. You've done the same thing that you, your fathers come out of. You turn right back around and done the same thing. Bottle it up. Main one church over here and another over here and fight one another. If this person don't come to your church, you have no cooperation with it. Oh, you poor backslidden hypocritical so-called Christian. Shame on you. Your hour is at hand. God will punish you for that as certain as I'll be his servant standing here. Separating the laity and making differences between brothers. God have mercy. Nothing against the Pentecostals, that system. Nothing against the Catholic, it's the system of Catholicism. Nothing against the Methodist, it's that system. 
Nothing against the Lutheran, it's the system. Justification by Luther was right, but when they systemized it by organizing it, they did wrong. And the Wesley, Luther never organized it. Once after him did. Wesley never organized it. Once after him did. And it wasn't the Pentecostal fathers that come out of that corruption. It's you bunch after him did. Exactly what you've done. That's where we're at today. If the Pentecostal church would stand 200 years of from now, the, dis- the, grain, the ground that it's gained in the world and these past 30 years or 40, it would be worse off than the Catholic doctrine today. The Catholics started Pentecost too. What did it? Twisting us. Now, but the true seed remains right. Notice, what if that tutor that's taking care of the child back around the Old Testament, oh, if that child just like the father, my, everything the father said, yes, that's it, amen, that's true. We'll do it that way. How that tutor must have walked up before the father and said, your son is a wonderful boy. Just the things that you do, that's exactly the way he does it too. I don't care how you got some bosses and superintendents out there, but oh my, they don't bother him. He stands right exactly like you do. Hey man, how that father must say, that's my son. I'm proud of him. Yes, sir, he's my son. Someday I'll show the world that he's my son. All right. You don't pay attention to the straw bosses. He stays right with what the Father said. And how the Holy Spirit today must feel when he goes before the, the Father and says, Why, you know what? Your, your, your women's wearing makeup. They're bobbing their hair. Your man, their, your brother, their children is organized. Their church is just as tight as the rest of them. And they won't cooperate with one another and all these things. I must feel how, the, how God must feel about His church. I must be a disgrace. Why, well, I said, I thought I told them to stay out of Sodom. But they went right back in it, Father. Just like Lot, for a few nickels and a better place to worship in a bigger building and finer chairs and a better dressed preacher and one like this that can say, Ah, oh, man, real well. And then all we've got P-H-D-L-L-D behind his name and they can tell the rest of them all about this. God don't care a nickel for us about that. He wants a man that's filled with power in the Holy Ghost that'll stand and tell the truth regards to shut the hide off of him. Right. Where do we find it? Everybody's got a meal ticket and a Cadillac. Something's wrong somewhere. Something's wrong somewhere. That's the reason the church is rocking today the way it is because it's off the foundation. What happened when that son then became in the Old Testament I'd like to stay there a little while. We'll get back to it later. But now, what if that son then was a good boy? Stayed exactly like the father ordained it to be. If the Bible said one thing, he stayed right with it. Whatever the Bible said, he stays right with it. Regardless of what it is, no matter what the rest of them believe, all the straw bosses, he stays with the main boss. He stays with what God said. God said, let every man's word be a lie and mine be the truth. I don't care what comes or what goes, stay right with that. And we know the Bible predicts that the Pentecostal age will become a lukewarm, spewed out of God's mouth. We know that that's what the Bible says. Yes. Exactly right. Now we've got to face it. It's here. Now, well now if this son is a good son, then one day we have what we call in the Scripture, the Old Testament, a placing of a son. Or it's called sometimes a law of adoption. Now, this same son that was born into the family, and he never, he came, his name's no good on the chest, we call it like that. His name's no good out there yet. He's never had the law of adoption done to him yet. But when it comes to the time for the law of adoption, the father takes the son out into a public place and sets him up on a place and dresses him in a certain robe and performs what's known as the placing of her son or the law of adoption. And now, when this son is adopted into his own family, from then on, this son is given power. He's gifted. Then his name just as good as father's is on the check. 
because he's the boss. He's over the straw bosses. God gives him things that none of the straw bosses know nothing about because he's the son. Right. And that's exactly what God did to his own son. After he proved him in everything, and 17th chapter of St. Matthew, he take him up on the mount and overshadowed him there with a, with a cloud of glory. And his rain would shine like the sun in his heat or in his strength. And when he did, he heard a voice coming from heaven. Peter, James, and John said, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. What did he do? Place the law, his own law of adoption, upon his son. Place his son ahead of himself. No matter, there's Moses, I've talked to Moses, there's the law, there's the prophets, but this is my son. The law of adoption. Oh, Sabbath keepers and legalists, what's the matter with you? There's my son, hear ye him. True. Well, that's exactly what God did to Abraham, his son before that. After Abraham had been justified by faith, we believe that, don't we? Abraham, see? Justified by faith. Right? The next thing was then, what did he do? The uh, next thing was sanctification by the blood. Sanctification by the blood to the sea. Next thing was nursing God's own strength into him. Taking God's own strength into the church. What he did to Abraham, he did to his seed after him. Everybody understand that? All right? Now notice. Then he said to Abraham, notice this, fourth and fifth verse. Abraham... My covenant now is with you. Amen. What a condition that ought to have been. What a word of encouragement to an old man 100 years old. Right at 199. And tell him that he was El Shaddai. I now give you the strength. Now I'm going to place you with me. Now I'm the father of all creation. My name is Elohim. Anyone knows that the word Elohim means the, the all-sufficient one, the, the great self the existing one, Elohim. Now, my name is Elohim and your name is Abram. And you'll not no longer be called Abram, but you shall be called Abraham. Now, that's when we're going to get down to some real stiff teaching. Abraham. Watch. From Elohim to Abraham. He gave him part of his own name. When he placed him, notice Abraham and his seed. Now when God got the Pentecostal church raised, he began to place them, giving them gifts and so forth, and place them into the kingdom. But everybody wanted to have the same gift. No, oh my. There we went. So God don't stop God's seed just the same. Abraham's seed, it goes on just the same. Notice L-O-M. Abraham. Give him part of his own name because why? I have made you the father of nations. A father. I have made you a father of many nations and I'll put part of my name with your name. Oh, how I could squeeze something right here now. Give him part of that name. Abraham. And change Sarah's name because she's a part of Abraham. Now notice the very next thing we find done here is in the 18th chapter, the next chapter, that God appears to Abraham as he sat under the oak. I watch as he, he sees why he's placed his son, justification, sanctification, baptism of the Holy Spirit, giving a gift. Now, when he appeared to him just before he burned Sodom, I'm not prone to look at a television. Because I'm against some uncensored programs. But last night in the place where I was staying, I picked up a book after I got in real late and looked on a little reading a book there and said, Television Guy. And I happened to notice there there was a place where they was going to show these atomic missiles or something up in the Pentagon. So I went up to this radio or television and turned it on to watch this, this missile. See, this atomic affair that are... Or saucers, they call it, ever what it is. Been a lot of criticism, a lot of pro and con. But now just watch just a minute. Every man, you've got to write your opinion. I have to mind. Let me express mine. Now, before that Sodom was burned, just before, how many seen that program? I guess as many of you did, all right. 
It's not just something made up. It was from the government. And they've been on this, working on this research for years, and they know that it absolutely is the truth. It's true. That's nothing new. If they just only read the Scripture, they know right where they were at. They don't have to be worried about that. But now, let's place that right on this message now, just a minute. Now, when Abraham, after he had been justified, sanctified, received the Holy Spirit, received like that, and had placed the Son, this Son proved that he was, because he had the Spirit of God in him, he did the same works, what his Word was, or just exactly like the Word of God, we can never build a church up on 900 and something different organizations, and everyone different from the others. No, sir. No, we cannot. Now, notice. But when this son, Abraham's son, seed, is made manifest, then the Spirit of God in that manifested seed will do the same works that Jesus did because the same works of the royal seed will be in the seed of Abraham. Notice, placing the son, making him just like the son, is church. Now as we move on, Abraham sitting under the oak one day, he looked up and he saw three men coming to him. I place this down on your memory. He saw three men. They were dust covered, perhaps, and come from a distance. Abraham looked at them and he recognized there's something godly about the man. They didn't have their collars turned around, perhaps, and high turbans on, or neither were they called bishops. Or, but he looked at them. They were just ordinary men, clothed and just like the rest of the man dressed. And Abraham ran out to him and said, uh, My Lord, will you come in and sit down under the tree and I'll fetch a little water and wash your feet and uh, give you a morsel of bread and then you go on your way. Abraham knew. Now his Abraham's seed. Now remember, listen, it was just Abraham to recognize that. Did you know I talked to a Jew the other day that believes, always believe there's one God and he won't believe there's three of them. So he said, you know that meant Father, Son, and Holy Ghost there. Oh, mercy, how far can a man get away from God? Abraham never said, my Lord. He said, my Lord, kept the little Lord Eden. But Lot, the backslider down there, said, my Lord, when he saw two of them come up, L-O-R-D-S. But the man who was separated, no. When he seen him, he said, my Lord, Elohim. Come by and sit down here. And he walked up to him. And he ran and told Sarah, need some bread right quick of some meal. We want some cakes and, and go out and get a fatty calf. And they killed the calf and got things fixed up, brought out. And he sat there and eat it. Two of them went on down to uh, Sodom to preach the lot down there in Sodom and to bring that lukewarm church out. Now notice the three classes. Now there was Lot and Sodom and Abraham was the three classes of people on earth at that day. Now, please, listen close. That's the same way it steps today with the seed of Abraham. See? There was Sodom, the Sodomites. The world, sinners. There was the organized, lukewarm church sitting down there. Lot. The sins of the people vexing his righteous soul. That's exactly what the Bible says. There you are. Many righteous, good people down in there, which will be called out. But I'm not speaking of that right now. Now they sent a man down there to deliver them people. And he went down and preached to them. Watch to the church that was in Sodom, in the world. Now, sometime this week we're going to take the mark of the beast and the seal of God. And watch how they start right in Eden and come right out where Cain went out from the presence of God to get his wife. How a stayed in the presence of God and God is one. How the church is different ways. Went out with their organizations, uh, going out with their organizations, the system, and got himself a, a church, a bride. And when the real true church stayed with God, God. Perfectly. Now here's what's taking place. When these men went down there, and isn't it strange how he changed the name of Abraham from Abram to Abraham? And the messenger went out there to preach to these people to bring them out. And in this last day, the messenger that sent to those sodomites, 
And to call them people out of those places down there is called G-R-A-H-A-M. Not B-I-L-L-I-S-U-N-D-A-Y Sunday, but G-R-A-H-A-M. A messenger. Show me one ecclesiastical messenger stands in his place today. There's not nowhere on the earth to the Christian church like Billy Graham. What's he doing? Screaming, call out a thing. Separate yourself with the word of justification. To call him out and separate him. What did he do? His message blinded their eyes to the door. That's what it is today. The message blinds your eyes. They got so much organization in them, they can't see the door, and Christ is a door. Right. Oh, they say, well, I'm Methodist. <coughs> well, look here, Mr. Graham, I'm Presbyterian. I'm Lutheran. I'm... They don't see the door. And the message has blinded their eyes. Don't you see the miracle of God? See the lot group? Way over there in Solomon. Now watch. To this one who stayed back behind to the elected church. One. He said, now look, just a few days before that, Abraham's, Abram's name had been changed to Abraham. Now he never said, Abram, where is our wife, S-A-R-R-A? He said, Abraham, where is your wife, S-A-R-A-H? How did he know that if he was a stranger? I watch, he's talking to the elected seed now of Abraham. Now he's talking to Abraham, and as he did to Abraham, he's got to do to the seed after him. We found it everything perfectly up to this time. Abraham? The revelation? Where is your wife, Sarah? Said she's in the tent behind you. Now remember behind you. He said, I'm going to visit you. Ah, that personal pronoun is all. I'm going to visit you. That's how he knows his name was visit. He has one change his name. Abraham. I'm going to visit you according to the time of life of Sarah, and I'm going to send this child just exactly like I said I would do. See? I'm going to do it. And when Sarah heard that, now, my sisters in here, you young women, excuse this, please. But Sarah laughed. You know why she laughed? She said, me, an old woman, would have pleasure again with my Lord, him old also. Now, as husband and wife, as, as family relationship had ceased for many years, they was a hundred years old. She said, me, again, a young woman, could live with my, my husband there, and we'd have pleasure together like young married people, and it tickled her. And she said, me and the old woman live with my husband out there again. When we haven't uh, had uh, that type of life made for 15, 20 years. See, we, how could that be? And which, then the angel with his back turned. So why did Sarah laugh? Jesus referred to it and said it as it was in the days of Sodom. So shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So shall it be to the seed of Abraham. Can you see where Lot sits? Can you see where the message is? Can you see the message that's gone to the elected church? The power of God back amongst the people. God dwelling in human flesh of His own church performing those same signs. And they call it mind reading, mental telepathy, fortune telling. No wonder they're doomed. No wonder God and missiles there. They call it in the air and they know nothing about it. I'll give you my exclamation of it. It's angels. It's come down like they did there at Sodom. You know, I believe we had a picture one on the back on a picture here somewhere. It'll be in meeting the next couple of days. It's got the same spirit, it does the same things. That same spirit in the church will perform the same things Jesus did. And we watch. And on the Pentagon when they get around there and could see those Missiles gathering in around them like that. Not something made up, some fiction. It's actually the truth. Here it is on radar. Here it is on, on a camera taking it. And they're so fast so they would just disappear. Einstein proved before he died, if two missiles is coming fast enough or two men coming down the road in an automobile, 
could be coming fast enough they could pass right through each other without even disturbing each other. Coming so fast, but it takes take billions of miles per second to do it. But they would. Look at Jesus. We, we can't understand it. Well, Jesus has come into the room through a, a stone wall, the doors being shut, and stood there after he had his glorified body and eat flesh. Hallelujah. Oh, you talk about space age, the church is fixing to take one. Fast. Bragging about their planes going so fast we got a man in a Sputnik. What difference does that make to the church of the living God? Goodness. He said, when these things come to pass, lift up your head. There will be signs in the heavens above, and in the earth below, the sea will roar, and earthquakes in divers places. That's the time to begin to look up. Your redemption's coming near. You see the signs of Sodom, the organization where it's tucked the church out under that mystic, oh, self-righteous, legalistic way, but that man and woman who's waiting on the promise of God has the sign working among them as a true living God, discerning the very thoughts of the heart. It's the Word. Jesus was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. St. John 1. Is that right? Hebrews, the fourth chapter, says the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, discerning even the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And when the word, when God's word, not half of it, part of it, mixed up with some man-made creed, you abide me in my word, and you ask what you will, and be done. But when the true word becomes manifested in you, it's a discerner of the thoughts of the heart. And man call it man, mind reading, mental telepathy. No wonder they called Jesus Beelzebub. And he said, I forgive you, but when the Holy Ghost is coming, does it? One word against it will never be forgiven. Then you see why we got our name on a missile hanging out under somewhere. You see where judgment stands. Notice, sure we're doomed. There's the Billy Graham group down there preaching to that lot. Come out of Sodom. Get out of Sodom. Get out of Sodom. Maybe the boy don't know it for all I know, or the man, I think he's about 37 years old or 40, no, about 44 or something, 45, I don't know how Billy said, well, he's getting up somewhere in his 40s. But anyhow, how the man maybe don't realize what it is. See, there he is, he's the messenger of the day to that church. Not realizing he had to be called like that. How he's, everything, you say, how that name have to do with Why did he change Jacob's name? Why did he change all the rest of the names when they come to him? Your name is called Simon. Hereafter you be called Peter. You are Saul, but you'll be called Paul from now on. How about all these names if they don't mean something? Or you say that's numerology. The devil's got one. That's right. And God's got one. Everything the devil's got, he's patterned it off of God. Exactly right. Change his name. After Jesus overcome, he received a new name himself. Ever overcomer. The church, when it's completely overcome, the revelation of it begins to be real to them. Why was he called that? Why is he a messenger of the day that when the man is, in, just like it was in Eden, he destroyed himself by his own knowledge, and today he's doing the same thing, destroying himself with his own knowledge. Watch now, just a few minutes before we close. we got really got 30 minutes, but we won't have to take it. Look, I want to ask you something. Now, he went down and preached them angels. Did this other one stay behind, messenger? Some minister asked me one time, Brother Van, did you say that was God? That was God. Abraham called him Elohim. If you want to argue with Abraham, the Bible, that's all right. But he said it was Elohim. Stood there and eat flesh with ordinary clothes on. Eat flesh, drink the milk of the cow. Eat bread. Vanished out of Abraham's sight. He was Elohim. Proving what when Jesus referred to it, that Elohim would come back into the seat of Abraham at the last days. And as it was in the days of Sodom, to the elected church, so shall it be. And to the church in Sodom, so shall it be. Now we see where they're standing, don't we? We see the names, everything placed just exactly. Just perfectly where we're sitting. What did he do then? Immediately after that, as I've tucked this many times, I believe I preached on it one time for you. He changed Abraham and Sarah's body and put them back to a young man and woman. Now we, we know that that is the truth. Now remember, now let me prove it to you right here so that you, if you get any thoughts that they were, uh, in them days they just lived longer. The Bible said here that they were both well stricken in age. 
well stricken. Then why did Sarah say that I could have pleasure with my Lord? And Abraham, the Bible said that his body was as good as dead. The seed in his body was as good as dead. And 45 years after Isaac was born, he had seven more children. And so that was just... Why did Amalek fall, Amalek fall in love then with Sarah? When she was an old woman, said, Me an old woman, well stricken age. Me old like I am now, could ever have pleasure again. And when she took a 300 mile journey and went out and seen a young king, he fell in love with her, the most beautiful thing he ever seen. He changed her body. Why? He had to change her body in order to receive the promised son. And that's the next thing in order. The changing of the body, the rapture. Now what if he had just talked, Abraham said to Abraham, I'm just going to turn you back to a young man, go turn Sarah back to a young woman, and now you all just go ahead and have the son. They wouldn't have done it. Because they lived together when they was young. And they didn't have the son. They did not have any son. And they'd lived together all these years. If you just changed them back, there had to be a different kind of change. Oh, Lord. She couldn't have went in labor with a heart a hundred years old. The milk beans is dried up in her body. Her womb was unfertile. Oh, I know it seems strange. I know it does. It seems strange. Could you watch a little baby before it's born, when it's in its mother's womb, could say, Oh, woe is me. They tell me I'm going to be born in a few days. What do I do? Uh, they tell me it's a big world, these sunshine, people walk around, ooh, how I, well, how I'll get a living. I drive my living from right here in the womb. All that big face, what will it do? Woe is me. But if he could only think of what it was, if he could, after you're once out on this side, and then look back, you never want to go to the womb again. And that's like we are now, thinking about what's that going to be? What's the other, other world where we can pass from glory? Why, when they can take a scope and see 120 million years of light space, that ain't one sixteenth of an inch in eternity. Yeah. Hallelujah! Yeah. Why? But Jesus come from heaven to earth in a thought. Glory. And the church will be the same way. Pass right with that speed. Glory to God. You say, how can it be done? It's like, how do I know now? Only thing I know is inches and yards and miles and <laughs> days and weeks and hours and minutes. That's the way we figure. We're in the womb of the earth. But wait till we're born once on the other side. Glory. Wait till this change comes. Yes. Then space to come like a from the glory you heard one split half instant. That speed pass right through the wall, don't even know it's there. There you are. These earthly things would be so simple. It, it, oh my, there won't be nothing to it. Not when Abraham's body was changed, Sarah's body was changed like it never had been changed before. Now we all know that when Jesus comes. We'll be caught up in a rapture, and we know our bodies will have to be changed first. And it'll, it won't have to be just go back to young men and women, but it'll have to be changed because Abraham and Sarah's body had to be changed in a way that they could receive the promised son. That's Abraham. His body had to be changed to receive the promised son. It had to be justified, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit, called by election. Manifest the God of glory in the midst of him. And then his body was changed in order to receive the promised son. Well, the church has come through justification, sanctification, baptism of the Holy Ghost, gifts manifested to it. And now what? The Spirit of God moving in the church, doing the same works that Jesus did before he left as a promise. And what's the next thing? The change. The next thing happened to Abraham was a changed body. He had to have it or he never got the sun. And the next thing that happens to the church is the rapture. We'll have to be changed and caught up in the air to meet him. We can't meet him on earth. We've got to go in the air to meet him. It's the coming sun. The promised sun. Amen. We've looked for him now for hundreds of years. He will come someday. But the next thing for the church is to be changed. We've had ever sign, justification, sanctification, baptism of the Holy Spirit, placing of the Son, manifestation of the Spirit. Now what? The changing of the body for the rapture. Oh my. How the church ought to be waving its hands in glory. 
thanking God, thanking God any minute the change could come. For the Bible said it would be universal. Jesus said it would be two in the mill, grinding, I'll take one and leave one. Two in the field, I'll take one and leave one. Two in the bed, show it be on both sides of the earth. What's night on one side, be day on the other. I'll take one and leave one. The rapture will be universal and their bodies will be changed. Our bodies will have to be changed. We just can't turn back to young men and women. We've got to have a different kind of a body so we can be caught up in the air to receive the promised Son. That's what the church is waiting for now. The true church. Every manifestation. What He did to Abraham, He has done to His seed after Him, leaving one thing out. That's the rapture of the church. And when you see these things begin to come to pass, Jesus said, raise up your head. Look up. Your redemption's drawing nigh. When Jesus referred to it, He said, as it was in Sodom, when you see a modern Billy Graham go down into Sodom, when you see the signs begin to appear before the elected church and the rest of it fighting against it, watch the time of the rapture is at hand. The fig tree putting forth its buds will be on her. That generation will not pass away till all be fulfilled. This is way into that generation since the Jews have been returning to their homeland. We're at the end time. Nations are breaking. Israel's awakening. The signs that the prophets foretold. The Gentile days numbered with horrors and cumbrance. Return, O dispersed to your own. Come go with us to Miami. When a man that stood with his hand yonder in Greenland to turn atomic bombs loose that would destroy half the earth, shock and become a Christian, will be speaking. When he saw a missile in a screen and they thought it was Russia starting, we're ready too. Other nations are ready also. Castro used down yonder just as a, a puppet playing up so Russia can get in there close enough they can throw their atomic missiles and things. Here it is, right under our nose. And the gifts of God, the manifestation of God amongst His people doing the same thing that Jesus Christ did has swept the world across now. See, she's ready. Now the next thing is the change and to be caught up in the air to meet Him. The change to those who are looking for the promised Son. Are you looking for Him this afternoon? Waiting? Oh, I'll be watching and waiting. That sight to behold. He's coming again. The Gentile days numbered with horrors and cumbers. Why this earth will blow to pieces one of these days? It could happen before morning. There's only one thing that the Almighty God could keep us from being blown to pieces but in another hour from now. Russia's so far ahead of us in science. And as that news commentator said the other night, it's not Russia doing that. Neither is it our scientists. It's the Germans is what's done it. In the war, we took some and they took some. And there you are. They've got a man now that goes... Stands up in a little gadget, a Sputnik of a thing up there on the earth. What if they might have hundreds of those? What if they just come over to the United States and say surrender or go to ashes? Surrender, of course. What would happen? In would come the Russians out of your home. You know what would happen? If they don't, what happens? Ashes come. When could that happen? In another hour from now. But remember, before that happens, here's where you disagree. But before that happens, Jesus comes for the church. Before one speck of fire fell on Sodom, Lot had to come out. Before one drop of rain fell, Abraham had to be in the, I mean, Noah had to be in the ark. And as it was in the days of Abraham, the days of Noah and in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Before anything takes place, the church takes its rapture. Amen. They're in Christ, already judged. And one of these mornings, there'll be a disappearing. And one of these nights, there'll be a disappearing. And the church will be changed and caught up to meet Jesus in the air. And woe unto this bunch stand. They'll gnaw their tongues for pain when the atomic sweeps into the nation, burns eyes out and runs like water down. And tongues are gnawed for pain and screaming, just one bomb bursting after another. You remember how much it was mental telepathy, how much is a bunch of holy rollers or fanatics. Remember, God knows what He's doing. Yes, sir. The next thing waiting is for that elected and called out seed of Abraham who's recognized the manifestation of God among His people and standing waiting. That'll be the one who'll be caught up to meet Him in the air. Let us bow our heads just a moment. 
If there is those here today who does not know Him as personal Savior, that you have not been filled with the Holy Spirit, that the revelation of God has never struck your life, and you've just joined church and lived a good straight life, do you know that those Hebrews back there, those priests, they lived a perfect life? No one could put a finger on their life. They were holy, sanctified man. And Jesus said, you are of your father the devil. What is sin? Is unbelief. Unbelief in what? The Word of God. Now, that's the Word of God to Abraham and his seed after him. If you haven't been known to God as his son, have been born again, filled with his spirit, you've never drawn from El Shaddai, the bosom of God, why don't you come right here and stand here? Let's have prayer with you while minister brothers all around to pray. Will you rise now? I believe the hour of all this persuading is just over. If you haven't received Christ and been filled with the Spirit, come. One poor soul walks to the altar. And that a Jew. A next to Ethiopian. God be merciful. How can you hear the Word of God and then sit still, friends? Don't you see that science said about five years ago it's three minutes till midnight? Do you know what God did? He reached, it's past time. He reached out with His hand and stopped it. He's holding time in His hand for the church to make itself ready. There's a few more members yet to come in of the body of Christ. Maybe one of them sure today. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm led here is to try to persuade you. I'm not saying, now don't be Catholic, don't be Methodist. I say, what for you to belong to? You belong to all of them or none of them. But I want you to be filled with the Spirit. If you're not, you're, just remember, I'll meet you that day. And these words will be a witness against you. It's all on God's tape recording and with His great picture camera. And you setting and walking away and leaving it, You'll see your own self at that day in the mayor of God. Will you come? Have thine own way. Thou art the Father. I am. Just forget everything. Now, come on, I'm the clay. Mold me and me. Let thy will be done, Lord. Take all the church entity out of me. Take all the stir- starch and denomination out of me, Lord. Let me be a real Christian. Lord, have Oh, Lord, my being, have Bless you, lady. Come right ahead. And All you Catholics, Baptists, Presbyterian, Methodists, Pentecostals, While the people are moving down, still coming. As long as people are coming, we're going to hold it. I don't think we have too much more time. 
this world to make these kind of calls. I just remember, I speak in the name of the Lord. The hour is coming when you'll scream for a meeting like this. You won't be so anxious to get up and go out. It'll be too late then. You'll go out all right. Out into an eternity without God. Without You call me a prophet. I never call myself that you do. And where does the word of the Lord come to? What does the word prophet mean? A divine revelator of the divine written word. Then you have your own interpretation to take it above the real word. Signs and wonders prove whether it's right or not. God told them how to tell it. If what they say comes to pass, then it's right. If it isn't, it isn't. Now you be your own judge. You better flee to God, Pentecostal, while you've got a chance to. You just take some idea that I spoke with tongues and that means all of it. And that's just as far as Methodists shouting, Lutheran shaking hands. Better come to God. Oh, I am waiting. Now remember, after this message this afternoon, I am free from all man's blood. The meeting has been get out in Chicago. I've told you, thus saith the Lord. I've proved it to you by the scriptures that were at the end. Now, I'm not guilty of any man's blood from henceforth. I wonder how many Christians out there would walk up to the altar and pray with these people around, stand around the altar and pray. Any of you Christians that still with the Holy Spirit would like to come up here and pray with these people? Me and me. After thy will, why am I waiting? Abraham and his seed after him. Abraham and his seed. Let me tell you something. Just a few days ago, I was in California in a great denominational church, Pentecostal denomination. A few people came to the altar, four or five, after preaching a hard message. And then four or five sinners were up the altar, falling over one another. I had to beg and persuade people to come pray with them. I did that for a purpose this afternoon, see who had come up. And amongst about 300 people, it looked like come to pray. While the Kentucky Baptists down there in the mountains where I was born will make the Pentecostals feel ashamed of themselves. Let one soul reach up and come towards the altar. There'll be the whole church right around him trying to so thankful to God that one soul has come in. And then we are Abraham's seed. We've lost all the zeal we ever had. See what I mean? Oh, God, let's bow our heads. Do you people at the altar here? I want you to surrender life to Him now. Remember, I'm going to meet you at that morning. I'm going to give an account for this message this afternoon. I've been in Chicago since the beginning of my ministry, as it is ending now. I cannot be a prophet and an evangelist at the same time. One ministry will take its place soon. And a time after time, how I've been here in Chicago, stood hour after hour, heart to heart with you. Have you ever heard me tell you anything in the name of the Lord but what was true? If it is, I ask you to come correct it. No, sir. It's not known. Then I'll tell you in the name of the Lord. Under such a condition, if you come up here today, God led you up. This is the hour of your deliverance. If you'll believe it with all your heart. I want you just to, just humbly, just confess everything that you have did that's wrong before God. Say, God, I'm sorry of it. And now I'm here wanting you to give me the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Granted, while we close the service, if you're around the altar here praying, I'm going to ask the congregation all to stand in prayer.
your hands on one another around the altar here, you people with these. Our Heavenly Father, we bring to you this afternoon the, the fruits or the gleaning. The land has been harvested long ago. And we're gleaning as Ruth. How well our evangelist brother know these things. Our brother Tommy Hicks here and brother Oral Roberts and Billy Graham. And how that, that they know that we're just gleaning in America see if we can find a stalk here or there. We know the end is at hand. Father God, these who come, thou hast said in thy word, he that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. And also that no man can come except my Father draws him first. And all that comes to me, I'll give him everlasting life and raise him up at the last day. That's your promise, Lord. And as your servant and the fruits of this message, I give to you these seekers at the altar. I give them to you, Lord, as your servant in prayer. And with all these other servants of yours who are standing here, who are witnesses of your resurrection, witnesses of the power of God, and we're standing here deeply Lord, sincerely from my heart, believing that you're the Son of God. Believe that you are coming in all these fearful sights that we're seeing and hearing the nations are shaking and see Israel going to her homeland. The nations are troubled. Seeing mystic sights over Washington. Fearful things upon the earth. Perplexity of a time and distress between the nations. Distress. Such a distress. They're all so nervous they don't know what to do. Each one with atomic and hydrogen weapons hid back secret, just wait for the other to make a move. Someday, a mistake. Too much vodka will be drinking or something. Then a missile will fly into a screen. Then here it goes. God, you promised us. Now I'm believing you. Noah stood in the ark door and preached to a dying people. And the day the real born-again man of God stands in the door of Jesus Christ and shows the people the way out. Not a church, not an organization, but the door of Christ. May these people come to the door right now, knocking at the door. We know there will be a welcome hand. Reach out and say, Come, you blessed of my fathers. Enter into the joys that's been prepared for you since the foundation of the world, because no man could come but those who he foreknew. And they've come this afternoon, and I give them to you as your servants and as your people. Grant it, Lord, to each one of them in the name of Jesus Christ. While each person in here, you people that's around the altar, by faith, by faith, you don't have to feel one thing, but in your heart. Now, how'd you come up here? God, back there in the audience, draws you up here. Jesus said, No man can come to me except my Father draws him. And he that heareth my words and believeth on him and send me has eternal life. And there's only one form of eternal life. That's the Holy Spirit. Now, if you will believe with all your heart that God will give you the Holy Spirit, raise up your hands and say, Thank you, Lord. I've come here now to receive it. All you out in the audience that believe with us, raise up your hands and say, Lord, we stand ready for the Holy Spirit. Well, Tommy, I want you to come and offer prayer now over them. Thank you. Yes, sir. All in the